time I was training at David Arquette's backyard. Um, and David Arquette was sitting there when I was having this discussion with uh, Roy Isaacs about my name. And uh, David Arquette is the one who said, how about Mae Valentine? And I was like, that's Aww. it. Mae Valentine by Billy Corgan and David Arquette. And that's my name. Well, let us go ahead and bring out our wonderful, fabulous, multi-talented, honorable guest. We're very excited to have her with us today. I'm going to do my best to pronounce this correctly because she is AKA May. So let's go. It is Maida Diaz Gomez. Hi. Hi. You pronounced that perfectly. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yay. Hi ladies. How are you? We're so good. How are so you? Excited. I'm great. I'm in LA. Also hot. Also hot. <laughs> yeah. Also hot. The common thread between the three of us. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I mean, like, I feel like I haven't seen you in what, like a year and a half, right? Well, it's the been... last time we saw each other was through Skype. <laughs> through during Skype. quarantine. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Okay. But face to face, it's been a while. Yeah. Um, and I kind of wanted to start by saying, you know, I feel really like honored that I got to meet you, you know, during our adult life. But the first thing Danica and I want to know is what would you say like you were like as a kid growing up and what were some of your biggest influences? Some of my biggest influences generally? Sure. Well, yeah. As a kid, I was a very creative and artistic kid. Um, my dad was a television writer and my mom was a television actress. So my childhood was basically surrounded by television and movies and plays and everything was always very creative and artistic. Um, and I always loved theater. I always loved movies and I always loved music. Um, and I was a very musical child. Um, I loved dancing and singing and playing guitar. And I pretty much grew up with MTV that's something that I normally talk about. So I loved like pop artists and rock and roll artists and hip hop artists. So I grew up in tune with all of that. Um, I feel that when I was a child, child, like my, my influences were like the Spice Girls and the Backstreet Boys. And then at some point um, I discovered the Rolling Stones. I found uh, one of my parents' albums of the Rolling Stones. And then I got turned on uh, to rock and roll. Hell yeah. So rock and roll then became my influence. I'm very young, like since I was basically 10 years old, I want to say. Wow. Well, okay. So since you mentioned the Spice Girls, the follow-up question, which is very important, is which Spice Girl did you most identify with? I loved Sporty Spice. <laughs> and I'm not sure why, but I think it's because her. I loved her voice the most at the time. I loved Sporty. Mel C so much. Yeah, um, and then I think when I grew up, grew a little bit older, I liked Jerry a little bit more, uh, and then Jerry broke my heart, of course. Broke yeah, all of our hearts. yeah, yeah. Like Danik and I, like I've known Danica since we were in second grade, so it was always like a back and forth, like who was what Spice Girl. But I think we settled on Danica was Baby Spice, and I was Ginger Spice. Right? Is that what we landed on? But That's I'm so funny funny. because then we ended up switching hair colors later on. That's so right. It was like. Say, you're <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad now we have a sporty because our is yeah. finally over. <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay, that's that's awesome. Yeah, I and I yeah. actually I actually had the opportunity uh, to watch their their comeback show in in London two years ago. Oh, and sweet. I never seen them when I was a child, so that was like a dream come true for me. Uh, I don't think I could handle that. I was yeah. really, like overwhelmed. What was it? It was without Posh though, right? She kind without of. Without Posh, mm -hmm. yeah. Posh refused to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. I still got to listen to the songs and those songs meant so much to me as a child. Like they bring back so many happy memories of a time when everything was just like very simple and innocent and all you cared about was learning choreography with your friends. <laughs> And yes. it was very emotional for me, actually. Like, I, I was very happy. Oh, do yeah, you, That must have been so cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I could handle it. But were, were you a fan of the movie? Yeah, of course. I had everything Spice Girls that possibly exists, <laughs> from the Polaroids to the Popsicle, I mean, the Lollipop. The, the Lollipop. Oh, yeah. The video game and the, like, albums. Like, everything. Posters. 
everything. Yeah. Now, if oh, we yeah. could only get that tour bus, because that tour bus was immaculate. <laughs> there was like a I know. Up. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I know. Not even fair. Not even fair. <laughs> well, speaking of your, you know, you outside of your love of music, um, what kind of other fandoms helped shape you growing up? So um, did you have any other things that you pursued as well as music? It was mostly focused on music, honestly. I thought that I would be a, a singer, a musician. Um, and I ended up writing about music. So when I was 18 years old, I actually um, started working as a music journalist. So my life was pretty much always revolving around music and rock and roll and music artists. That's great. Well, uh, you you also briefly, you know, mentioned your parents as well. Um, did you ever have the desire to pursue acting like your mom? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I always enjoyed acting, too. I, I did theater when I was a child. I was in a lot of plays. Um, and yeah, like I would say my mom and my dad were huge influences, if, if you want to say, just because like I feel like I looked up to them and I thought like that's what happiness was you know it's my mom was very happy in her job and my dad was very happy in his job and yeah I always loved acting um, I wrote a lot of plays when I was a kid like that was one of my favorite things and I'd write them and play them for um, my parents friends that just sit and watch <laughs> it I'm sure it was so so interesting um, but yeah absolutely and when I was a kid I actually um, was invited to play a role on uh, a soap opera that my mom was playing at the time. And I was going to play my mom when she was younger. Um, but it was like a really um, dark sort of scene. Uh, mm. My dad didn't want me to be a part of it. Mm. And then my dad passed away when I was 11. So and then my, my life changed that directions completely. But I feel like if my dad was still alive, probably I would have maybe been an actress. Mm hmm. Do you remember one of the first plays that you wrote? Can you tell us maybe what it was about? Yeah, uh, I remember because they're written in my diaries and I still have all my diaries from childhood. Nice. So I can go back to things and actually know what I felt at the time. And I think one of the first plays that I wrote for school was called The Dead House. So I was obsessed with horror stuff. So oh, we're talking about awesome. fandoms and stuff like that. <laughs> horror for sure. Freddy Krueger, anything Freddy Krueger, nice. um, Stephen King, I was obsessed with as a child. So I wrote this play, I, I can't really remember, it's about zombies or something, but awesome. it was called The Dead House. <laughs> and my uh, second grade, was it second or third grade class, um, uh, put it, put it on. And I remember the teacher's only request to me was, I'll allow you to write this play and, and we'll put it on but you have to introduce new vocabulary to the class. So my job was to put like new vocabulary into my writing so that there was a reason for the class uh, to act it out. So I remember that. That's, that's, that's interesting. very cool. Yeah, yeah. I, that's, do, do you and still, I still remember one of the vocabulary that I introduced was on the nick of time. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. It's important. It is. It is. Do you still follow the horror genre? Like, do you still like horror movies and zombies? I, I still and... love horror, but I can't say that that I'm actively following. Like, I would love some recommendations. <laughs> uh, Steven in the funny. chat says, yeah, Army of the Dead, which was a good. I mean, it was, you know, it's on Netflix. If you got Netflix, check it I out. I haven't seen it yet. Is it good? I enjoyed it. I mean, I'm a zombie person, though. I'm okay. zombie vampires. Oh, there you go. I wrote you a zombie play. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah, I just, I, 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 I don't know. I love all things horror. Yeah, I'm, Me I'm too. super into it. I but, have uh, um, a big Freddy Krueger tattoo on my arm. Oh, oh. Have you ever, have you ever <laughs> met like Robert England? Or? I have, and he's so wonderful. I love him so much. I'm I'm looking forward to finally meeting him in October. He'll be oh, at Spooky are? Empire. He's yeah. So cool. He's so nice. <sighs> You'll love him. <sighs> Another <laughs> moment where I'll have to compose myself and, and try my best to keep it together, but I'll just Honestly, I was shaking when I met him. I couldn't believe it. I was so excited. <laughs> where where did you first meet him? I think it was on the first week that I had moved to Hollywood. And 
like crazy. Um, and I was living at this building on Hollywood Boulevard and there's a, a bookshop across from the building. And I think I random, randomly walked past it and there was a sign saying Robert England signing autographs for Halloween, like it was close <laughs> to Halloween. And I couldn't believe it. Like that was one of my first Hollywood experiences. Like I crossed the street to meet Freddy Krueger. <laughs> and he was just there. Like, yeah. And he was so awesome. And I told him that I was in love with him when I was a child <laughs> <laughs> and that I had this insane phase where I wanted to marry Freddy Krueger and my parents couldn't understand it. And he, <laughs> he drew me this really cool autograph, like a caricature of Freddy Krueger saying, Freddy loves me. And I have that. Aww. Yeah. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> Did you already have the tattoo or was that? No, I didn't. It was after. crazy. Oh, that is amazing. Oh, cool. Yeah. I love it. Well, we wanted to ask you a little bit more about your, your writing, obviously, since you've, you've written, published so many works now. Um, what kind of influence would you say your, your father had on your writing style? Did you take any of his style <clears throat> into yours? I don't think I took any of his style but i think that we're just similar in some ways i think that just comes from me being his daughter uh but our writing is is very very different um uh, my dad's writing was very political um mm -hmm. he wrote a lot about what was going on in the country he had a lot of um different plays and soap operas that were actually censored by the dictatorship in brazil at the time because my dad was so critical of things that were going on in the country. Um, he was like pursued by dictatorship. He had to eventually like at some point, like go oh into God. hiding and change his name. So his writing career was very uh, political and very focused on like criticizing things that were wrong with the government. Um, and then at some point he started writing for, for television. And that's like, he viewed that as a, as a way to broaden you know, um, his messages and his criticism. Um, and that's what became known as uh, the soap opera that everybody knows today. My dad was one of the first people to write um, soap operas. And he wrote like the first um, colored television soap opera, for example. Mm -hmm. He wrote um, the first um, gay couple in a soap opera, the first uh, black man in a soap opera. So he did a lot of, um, how do you say that transgressional things yeah, yeah, yeah. like he, he was revolutionary trailblazing kind of thing yeah trailblazing yeah yeah mm -hmm. and then in my writing it was always more focused on like um it has like a diary style to it and it's always mm -hmm. focused on what's going on inside the character's head uh my first book was kind of a memoir it's a memoir slash fiction but it it was based on problems that i was going through when i was a teenager so it talks about depression and drugs and abusive relationships and uh, things that I was going through as a teenager after my dad died. So my, my writing is more like, I would say it has a very female point of view to it. And it has a very like intimate um, sort of point of view to it. So yeah, it's very different. But if you read him and you read me, sometimes you can kind of feel like similar flows that I just think hmm. comes naturally if that so, makes any sense no mm -hmm. d definitely yeah, absolutely so when when you were writing because you obviously have books and novels did you refer to your diary a lot yeah i did um and i'm lucky because i started writing in diaries when i was about i think nine and i wrote up until i was 15. so i, I actually can go back and reread everything that happened in my lower school, middle school, high school years. And it's it's crazy because I, I remember things perfectly and obviously that's because I wrote them down, otherwise I probably wouldn't. So sometimes I still go back to my diaries, like I understand something new about myself or you know I go through something, a sort of like emotional breakthrough or whatever and I go, okay, I can go back to like, my seventh grade diary and see where this started or see what caused this trauma or it's very very interesting like danik and i we kept like a dual diary i don't know what we what we would call it i literally have it right over here where we would like write each other back and forth like every single day but i'll really? tell you what oh i'm terrified to open that book i don't want to oh, we know. gotta do it oh. should, I, should i grab it i don't want to yeah. do it I'm kind of like, Okay. Oh, it's gotta be. It, there's gotta be some gems in there. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm trying to know 
was like, I hope that Oh my god. Uh, yeah, I well, you've usually known forget each other about that. Forever. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Oh my. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Okay, just kidding. Pick my husband good. must have moved it. It's not there. Oh. Or it might be in another drawer. I'll have to I'm find it. I'm downstairs. But... If I was in my apartment, I would grab you one of the diaries. I'd be oh. happy to read something. Oh, man. Yeah, we probably don't want to read from ours, Danica, but uh, do you know where it is, Jude? Mine is very, like, not PG. Like, my thoughts, they were very, like, they Checkers were probably isn't either. They're a much older person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Jude is now looking for the book. It might oh, be no. over there. But while he's looking for it, um, what would you say was the most challenging part of writing and also the most rewarding part of writing? Well, obviously, um, writing a book is a really big task. Um, but at the time that I did it, like I wrote my book when I was first book when I was 16 years old. And I did it because I was in a very depressive moment of my life. And I actually had dropped out of school. And my mom was like, what are you gonna do with your life? She was very upset, obviously. Uh, I got myself expelled from school. I was as rebellious as it can get. <laughs> and I told my mom, I'm gonna write a book and I'm gonna be a bestseller. And my mom was like, very um supportive of it you know other parents might have been like yeah yeah sure you're gonna be a bestseller or whatever and be very angry but my mom actually supported me in writing the book um and i did it pretty much in six months that's how long it took me to write wow. it wow that's my first book the one that was a bestseller but it came from a place of depression and desperation and i I felt so unheard and misunderstood in the school that I was in and in the life that I grew up in that I needed to be heard. And I think that's why I was so desperate. I just really wanted to be understood and I really wanted to be heard as a teenager and all the problems that I was going through and things that I was blamed for or judged for. And I felt like there were there are reasons why I'm like this. There are reasons why I'm acting like this. Things have happened to me, you know, and I wanted to write about it. And I ended up getting published when I was 19. Um, <laughs> and amazing. it was a bestseller. And like teenagers in Brazil, like related to it so much. And I was like, yeah, like this is something like this is something that we all feel and we all go through. And I'm glad that I was brave enough to to talk about it as honestly as I did, because I don't know if I would be so brave now. Like it came with so many consequences to have written that book, you know, like I was I was talking about people that I know. I was talking about places that everyone knows. I was talking about the school, the teachers, the students, everything. And it was very brave <laughs> and very crazy at the same time. Definitely. Wow. But sometimes oh, I'm sorry. So answering your question. So the biggest yeah. um, the biggest struggle really uh, came came after it was published, because I feel like the writing process at that point was actually um, just natural and it, it came naturally. But uh, the hardest part was dealing with everything that happened once it came out. Honestly, it was a lot of controversy. What was your mom's reaction to you becoming like a bestseller? My mom was very proud. Uh, even when I write the most absurd things, my mom is my fan. She loves everything that I write. Uh, I can be writing about the most insane thing that happened to me and my mom will be like momentarily pissed off, but she'll still think it's fabulous. <laughs> she was very happy. She was very supportive. She still is. That's awesome. Um, I do have our book, Danica. Oh, but it's probably it's probably God. best that if we we go over it after it says Dan That's Dana so Cow. cool. Is that like a silver chair cover or no? Oh, it, right. It looks like it. Right. Frog it does. Oh my God. I wish we'd been that cool. I know. And this is the back of the book that like fell apart. But that's awesome. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll read it. Oh, and this is a list of all of our ex boyfriends. <laughs> But maybe after uh, I, I don't want to oh bore my. I don't want to bore people. But afterwards, maybe we'll we'll go through it. it started definitely in, have to go through it. It started That's in the so year two thousand. Yeah. Really? Oh, okay. I thought yeah. we started before that. Okay. No, that one's two thousand. We'll we'll deal <laughs> nice. with her later. 
Nice. Cool. <laughs> well, we wanted to mention um, at one point I, I noticed you mentioned that um, you were interested in getting your novels translated into English. I wondered mm -hmm. if you were interested in still doing that, or if you're any closer to that, or if you wanted well, to I'm, translate I'm doing them into it myself. other languages. Yeah, I'm doing it myself. So it's like a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, I've had other people start to translate my book, but I feel like you have to be such a great um, Portuguese speaker and English speaker. And there are mm -hmm. so many things that are hard to translate because they're in a different culture or, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be very specific. And I just felt like I would be the best translator for it. And so I started doing the translation myself after a while. But I mean, I have four books, so it's four books that I want to get translated. And um, I mean, I want to, first of all, publish something new. And then I want it to come with my old work. I don't want to like be uh -oh. published for the first time in the United States with something that I wrote 10, 15 years ago, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's the path that I want to go with. Like I'm writing something new right now and I'm writing both in Portuguese and English. So I want to publish that. And then afterwards, like, oh, here's also my older work. So are you writing in Portuguese and English, like you're writing the same thing at the same time, like in yeah, two languages? Yeah, so, so, so hard. Every time wow. you edit one, you have to edit the other one. It's just like hell. It's not pleasant. It's not. <laughs> can, can you tell us what your next work is going to be about or is it secretive? Yeah, so, um, so the first book, the one that I was telling you guys about, uh, which talks about all the problems that the character uh, was going through uh, when she was 16, I started writing like uh, the follow up to that story. Only now she's in her 30s and she lives in Hollywood. So it's half a memoir, too. But I really wanted to talk about like what happens to what happened to all those issues, what happened to the drug issues, what happened to the depression, what happened to the abusive relationships? How do you? How do you go with those uh, problems uh, into adulthood? You know, what changes, what improves, what is still there? So I really wanted to like touch all those subjects again, but through like an adult perspective and even talk about some of the characters that are in the first book or like the first book focuses a lot on one of the characters, ex-boyfriends. And I sure, I'm sure people would love to know like what happened to the relationship with that ex-boyfriend and things like that. But it's more interesting now because the scenario is Hollywood and, and there's everything that comes with Hollywood. And in the first book, the character is becoming a writer. And now she's in her 30s and she's been published. She's been a journalist and she's lived this crazy life. So it's, it's basically about me, obviously, but with some things fictionalized. Well, congratulations. That sounds yeah. That sounds like that, a really cool idea too. I, yeah. I love that idea yeah. of seeing the progression of the character too. Yeah. That's very because cool. Because like, you know, depression does doesn't just go away. Drug addiction doesn't mm -hmm. just go away. The emptiness mm -hmm. you feel with, with someone's death doesn't just go away. You know, your pattern of relationships doesn't just, you know, get better. You don't just heal mm -hmm. from things. Sometimes you go right. through your whole life trying to heal and uh, work on certain things and I'm cer I'm certainly still working on a lot of things that I was working on when I was 15. Do, do you feel like this writing process, especially now revisiting this this character and obviously it being part memoir, do you feel like it's it's helping you heal? It's always very interesting. You have to analyze yourself very, very deeply. And I feel like w when you write something, it yeah, it does help you heal a little bit, but it helps you. How can I say this? It opens up your 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 um, perception of things even more, and you start to find out more things about yourself as you're writing. And I don't know exactly how to explain it, but you write something, and then it it goes into your life, and then you live something, and it goes into your writing. So I feel like it's a back and forth process. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, so I don't know if you if you do um, ever experience writer's block. I can't hear what? you. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Can, um, can you can you hear us? No. Okay. So um, let me see. You want to let me see. It's back. So, it's back. Oh yeah. Okay. If, if it does if it does happen again for whatever reason, if you sign out and sign back in, it usually fixes okay. it. Go ahead, Danica. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. 
Um, okay, so we're curious if if you ever experience writer's block, what do you do to try to get over that? All the time. I like my last <laughs> book was published five years ago, so I feel like five years of writer's block is a lot, and I need to publish <laughs> something new. Uh, but yeah, I like mostly. I feel like it's so hard to just focus your attention because it's such a continuous job. Um, and you're, you're, you have to always have a hundred percent of attention when you're writing and you're editing and you go back and forth, writing and editing and writing and editing. And a lot of it is just having the focus for it. Um, and that's a big issue for me because, uh, recently I was diagnosed with ADHD, which makes mm -hmm. perfect sense. I don't know why nobody diagnosed me with that earlier <laughs> in my life. Uh, but it makes perfect sense. And I have a really hard time focusing for long periods of times. Uh, so I think that's, that's what's uh, stopping me from publishing more. Um, but yeah, and, and perfect example, I forgot your question. <laughs> no, that, that was the question. That is the question. Okay. <laughs> that was the question. Well, uh, kind of to pivot a little bit, uh, who would you say is your favorite band or favorite person that you've had the opportunity to interview? Oh my God, I have so many favorite bands and I know that we have many in common. Yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, from like Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue and Alice Cooper and New York Dolls, Sex Pistols. I mean, there's just so many. I, I, I love uh, getting to meet uh, music artists it's it's such a blessing to to have that job to be able to sit down with people that you grew up listening your whole life so i always enjoy it but obviously i've, I've had uh my favorites there's those are some of my favorites <laughs> just, just a few <laughs> a few of many yeah do you have anyone that is still on your interview bucket list that you haven't yet had the chance to interview but you would love to i've never met anyone in the rolling stones and mm -hmm. I, I really need to meet one of the Rolling Stones <laughs> before I die. <laughs> um, I, there's so many people, honestly. Uh, music artists we're talking about? Any, anyone. Any, anyone. Gen yeah. I always uh, wanted to interview Eminem. Um, I never got to meet Eminem. Um, but there's just so many, I can't even think of it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Well kind of uh, transitioning a little bit from, you know, your role, you know, getting to interview so many incredible people, so many incredible bands and artists. And now you have this incredible role with the NWA as Mae Valentine. And I think it's so awesome. You know, you pivoted from a valet slash manager now to interviewer. So can you tell us a little bit about your transition from being a manager and valet to now your role as the interviewer? Yeah, um, well, I was in the first, I mean, not first, I was in the two last seasons before uh, the pandemic um, as a valet for Royce Isaacs. And the plan was for me to start working uh, as a valet, but then to eventually um, start wrestling. Um, but everything sort of got interrupted by the pandemic. Like, I feel like my progress was uh, paused uh, you know, because I was still very new. I had only been training for a year and a half and one year off really, really hurt me one year out of the ring. Uh, so the plans kind of changed for me. And also because the, the wrestler that I was working with was, is not no longer in the company. Um, and so Billy was trying to figure out, you know, how, how to still keep me in the show, how to still keep me in the company. And he felt like this interviewer role would be much more fitting to my personality than what I was doing before, which I agree with. Um, so yeah, he started trying out, trying me out as a backstage reporter, which is what I've been doing now. Uh, and then I've been thrown into commentary for the first time in my life. I was on That's the, uh, scary, the isn't it? <laughs> it's it's <very> so <laughs> scary. Yeah. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. And I, I learned like 10 minutes prior that I was the one on commentary. And I was like, are you guys <laughs> sure about this? You realize I've never done this before. They're like, yep, go out there. It's like, okay. Off you but go. Like, obviously, I'm, I'm so grateful that they're, they're trusting me that much. Uh, 
but I'm just getting thrown into new things every day now. <laughs> right, so they put you scary. out there. Yeah, but uh, how would you say uh, Billy is to work with and work for? I'm sorry? Uh, how is Billy uh, to work with? Well, I'm very, very grateful to Billy because he's the person who discovered me and, and brought me into wrestling. Um, so I'm reading here a question. I it, Yeah, you okay, can go ahead, Jane. How did your relationship start with Billy? What was your first? Yeah, so that's what I was going to talk about. Um, I I knew I knew Billy from the music industry, and I I met him before. He played a show, funny enough, at the building where I live, uh, ninety eight point seven radio station, used to be in my building, and so they used to do their <laughs> concerts on the rooftop of the building, and oh, only cool. people who lived here were allowed to go. So we had this like really vip concert experience it lasted like maybe six months i want to say before marshall's shut it off because it was tons of people on a rooftop and very loud music <laughs> but we had that going on for a while and so i met billy actually for the first time at my building uh, but i knew him from the music industry and had sort of met him a few times and then at some point i was uh cast for a smashing pumpkins music video this was a while ago i, I was in another one recently too but this was a while ago. And uh, Billy was on set, obviously. He was um, directing with Linda Strawberry. And so I reconnected with him there. And um, shortly after that is when um, I was in wrestling. I started going to wrestling school. And so Billy started following me and he started, you know, seeing my wrestling stuff and my wrestling videos. And he started talking to me about it. Like, are you wrestling? Like, what's going on? And he, he basically started talking to me you know, about joining the NWA, which I thought was completely insane because it was like my first six months in wrestling training and I didn't expect anything to happen. Um, so I'm so, so, so grateful for, for him. And he actually produces most of my stuff. Like when you guys see my interviews, uh, Billy's sitting behind the camera for most of them. So I, I work very, very closely with him and he has a lot of say in everything I do. Yeah, well, but it's been great. I was going to say good things happen to good people. And you're in the spot that you're in now because, you know, you worked really hard your entire life, you Thank know, you. And, and it's where you're meant to be. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Appreciate of it. Of course. And um, I, I'm not sure. And I'm, and, well, I'm sure you've talked about it before, but how did the name May Valentine came to be? Uh, yeah. So Billy was trying to think of a name for me and he wanted something kind of like, lock hearts or something with the hearts something like girly sort of um his idea was lockhart but i actually have a friend named leia lockhart so i said no i can't take my friend's name mm. um <laughs> we were trying to figure out the name and he liked may because he he thought it sounded kind of like old hollywood and may is my nickname from like my teen years P people call me may so i was like okay i can do with may because i didn't want to be like Paula or something and then for the rest <laughs> of my life I'm like Paula like, yeah you're, you're Paula oh <laughs> yeah so I was like okay May works and then we didn't know um what was May's last name and at the time I was training at David Arquette's backyard um <laughs> and David Arquette was sitting there when I was having this discussion with uh, Roy Sizics about my name and uh David Arquette is the one who said how about May Valentine and I was like, that's Aww. it. May Valentine by Billy Corrigan and David Arquette. And that's my name. I love that. I love that's, that. That's so cool. That's how that happened. <laughs> man, David Arquette, man. I, I love that man so much. I know. Oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and it's, it's a really good name. It's a, it's a really good name. Yeah. And I'm proud to tell that story. It's so cool. <laughs> it is. It, uh, it is. Uh, Danica, do you want to ask one question? I'll ask one more, then we'll go to the game. Sounds great. All right, so I think I saw this question in the comments as well, but we we're curious about your work with The Hollywood Reporter. Um, what would you say has been the most haunted location that you visited in Hollywood? It's the building I live at. It's the Hollywood Is it? Tower. Yep, it's the building um, that the concerts happened at. It's the Hollywood Tower. And uh, the Disney ride, the Tower of Terror, is actually based on the Hollywood Tower. So I live in that building of the oh, elevator. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and it was built in like 1922. Uh, I'm, I think it's 22 or 26, maybe. Uh, 
so like a lot of the silent movie stars uh, lived here, like Charlie Chaplin lived here, Marilyn Monroe, and I think like Carmen Miranda got married in the lobby. Uh, Rudo <laughs> Valentino lived here, and there's like a lot of like haunted stories. Like apparently the mafia used to uh, kill people, uh, throw people off the rooftop. Cool. Uh, yeah, it's just crazy here. And I've actually um, done a documentary about it. I can send you guys the link. Uh, yes, yes. Called Hollywood Hauntings, and uh, we we had a seance on Halloween night, and oh, it, yeah. it was crazy. And I've actually done this uh, several times because sometimes, like one of the shows that do like haunting investigations, they'll find out that I live here and I do this, and then I'll be a guest at a show. So I've done this in at least like four TV shows where the crew comes oh my to my God. apartment to see how haunted it is. So That's and it so cool. really is. It's not, it's not a bullshit. Like it really, really is. That's um, very cool. Yeah, every <laughs> resident has a story. Like every resident. Oh yeah, uh, Jude says we need to have you on with Steve Gonzalez. Agreed. Uh, he's from, from Ghost Nation, formerly yes. Ghost. Well, I think that's Ghost Hunters again. I think yes. it's circled back to Ghost yeah, Hunters. So then, usually, I bring my friend. Uh, her name is Patty Negri, and she's a medium and she's a witch, and she's been in uh, Ghost Hauntings and all of those television shows. Cool. She's like the most popular medium on that's all those. That's very shows. cool. So she'll yeah. come here and she'll hold the seance, and crazy stuff always happens. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. I love mm -hmm. that. Yeah. <laughs> I already have problems sleeping at night. I don't know if I could deal with being haunted or dealing with <laughs> Oh my God. Well, uh, okay. Our final question before the game. Obviously, you excel at so many different things um, from interviewing to writing. But what job or thing would you say you're terrible at? <laughs> what job what? what? What job would you say you would be terrible at? anything that is not entertainment. Pretty okay. Much. I suck at everything else. <laughs> can, can you cook? Are you a good cook? I'm a terrible cook. So okay. There you go. There you go. I, I'm a terrible cook. I'm a terrible waitress. I'm a terrible <laughs> salesperson. I can think of many jobs. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, that makes you, I think Danica, you can cook, right? You, you got the cooking down I, or no? Yeah. My husband's better, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm I can't. just the worst. Like yeah. putting, it, putting it out there. I'm just the worst. All right. Well, we will not be seeing cooking with May Valentine anytime soon, but <laughs> maybe you will just to laugh. On okay. worst cooks in America. Yeah. Worst cooks in America, right. Or cooking with ghosts. Yes. Ooh. That could be fun. I'd watch that. Well, They'll cook well, for me. <laughs> Well, we have a game. This is a game of would you rather. There is absolutely no wrong answers. So, uh, Danica, do you want to read the first one? Oh, sure. Okay. Let's see. All right. Would you rather interview the Rolling Stones in a compact car or interview Metallica in a noisy room? Oh, my God. I would interview the Rolling Stones in a compact car. And I have <laughs> met a couple of Metallica members in, noisy, in their noisy room before. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure every room they're in is noisy, but yeah, right. I, I just want uh, to see if the sound is happening again. Okay, we'll we'll wait a couple seconds and see if it comes back. You let us know Maybe when you can hear us again. Yep. Yes. 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 Kitchen tools flying around. I like that comment, Stephen. I'd Damn like it. to see the hello. No. 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 Can you hear us? No. Okay. Sign out and come back in. I don't know if, if, if this is my sign language works, but. Oh, it's back. It's back. It's back. Okay, oh, yay. yay. <laughs> we did it. All right. We did here's, it. <laughs> we did it. Technology, guys. We got you. All right. Here's the next one. Would you rather go bungee jumping or swim with the sharks? Oh, my God. They're both terrifying. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't. I wouldn't do either of those. No, neither. <laughs> Uh, maybe bungee jumping. I no, not no sharks for me. Okay, all right, bungee jumping it is. That's you are yeah. much more brave than me because I would never go. I would never go bungee jumping ever. I'm scared no. of heights too. Me yeah. too. That's why I don't want to do it. <laughs> I still, I still want to jump out of a plane one of these days. I'll do it. Nope. But, all right. Nope. Next one, Danica. <laughs> Next. Would you rather manage your valet, the first wrestler you ever saw? or manage or valet the first wrestler you ever met? Oh my God. Um, 
I would manage the first wrestler I ever saw. Is that on television? <laughs> or think. yeah, yeah, in television, in person, just whoever you remember. Yeah, I, I'd love to manage China. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I used to love China when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, she's all I mean, first what female intercontinental champion in the WWF. She was a badass. She really, yeah, really was. I, when I was a kid, I, I I she was like, I loved China. I don't even know why. I because mean, I know she's now, badass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good choice. Good choice. Yeah. All right. Um, next one. Would you rather always dress? Like you're going to the Oscars or always dress in pajamas? This is 24 7, That's whether you're easy. going to the supermarket or what? I, I feel like I, I, I do both a lot. <laughs> I'm either in my pajamas or I'm dressed up for the Oscars. Uh, but if I had to choose one, I, I choose. I choose to look like the Oscars 24 7. I want like a makeup artist to show up at my house every day at 6 a.m. and glam me up every day of my life. That would be a dream. Yes, agree. Sounds okay. Yeah. <laughs> that Kardashian that. life. Right? right? I know. <laughs> Even though, I don't know, for me, pajamas might be it. Like, cute pajamas. No, I wouldn't wear those. I, I would love to be in pajamas, but then I'd have to, like, see the my potential love of my life in my pajamas. No. I'd rather be dressed up for the Oscars. <laughs> Good choice. Fair enough. All right. Next one. All right. Would you rather be in a music video for Motley Crue or be in a music video for Poison? Motley Crue. Are you? Well, I mean, they've. I they've, am actually in a music video in a Nikki Six music video. I'm really? In a Six a.m. music video. Oh wow! Very quickly, oh. but uh, yeah, for stars. Heck yeah! Oh, that's oh, awesome. That's okay. so cool. I will definitely check that out. Only <laughs> one more year till the Motley Crue tour. So yeah, I was. I was so mad when they postponed by a year, Me but too. it happens. I, I get it. I get it. And I think they're both on the, I think Poison's part of that, right? Poison, Def Leppard, Joan so. Jett. Joan I'm Jett, Molly Crew. Ooh, yeah. It's going to be awesome. One more year, guys. One more year. All right. <laughs> here's the next one. Would you rather be in a telenovela or be in a musical? Oh, wow. Um, that's tough. I would love to be in one of my dad's telenovelas, uh, but since my dad is no longer with us, I would love to be in a Broadway musical. Every time Any... I watch a musical, I cry because I want to be on stage. It, uh, do you have like a favorite musical or a musical that you would yes. like to be in? What Phantom is it? of the Opera is my favorite musical. Ooh, for good choice. sure. Good choice. Yeah, I've watched that a million times. <laughs> is it? Uh, I'm trying to remember if it's Phantom or Cats that's the longest running musical ever on Broadway. I think it's Phantom. Phantom. Phantom? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love it. All right. Uh, I Ooh. think we have one more. Oh, no, yep. two more. Okay. Oh, two more. Two more. Okay. Uh, would you rather only be able to listen to music from the 70s or only oh. be able to listen to music from the 90s? Well, I could play it cool and say 70s. Or I could be my real self and say 90s. So I'll be my real self, but I'll still pretend that I'm really cool and I only listen to 70s stuff. Yeah, man. We like your real self. It's okay. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're with you. Oh, yeah. We're, we're 90s. I'll... Oh, yeah. I yeah. love 90s. Yeah. Me too. Me too. All right. Here is the last would you rather. Oops. Would you rather let Billy Corgan pick your next tattoo or let the NWA fans pick your next tattoo. I think I, I, I trust I trust Billy to pick my next tattoo. Fair. Yeah, that, that's probably, probably have me get a smashing pumpkin tattoo. Would that be so bad? Yeah. <laughs> Cause I, I would love to know what the NWA fans would pick out. I know we should ask. Ooh. <laughs> okay, NWA fans, we right, want to know. Come on. Well, NWA fans in the house, please. Whoop, whoop. My next tattoo is on you. Uh, uh, that's that's yeah, very brave. Well, a lot of pressure. <laughs> we have officially come to the end of the Would You Rather game, and, uh, and the end. That I know was this... so much fun. Thank you. I love those those options. <laughs> Besides the the bungee jumping and the sharks. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, before we do wrap this up, is there any final thoughts that you want to leave us with? I just want to thank you guys. You're so much fun. 
uh i was so happy to meet you too i feel like we have so much in common and it's always a pleasure to talk to you and i hope we hang out when you come to la oh we gotta set something up we're gonna make it happen we're yeah. gonna make it happen maybe we'll see like motley crew or something <gasps> together or go to a fun show <laughs> heart be still absolutely yeah. <laughs> pencil us in uh before we do wrap this up though we're gonna go over our upcoming guests that we have for the next couple of weeks now that it's july it's insane tomorrow we have a uh, singer musician songwriter lucas rossi next week we have chum lee from pawn stars the following thursday casey jost and practical jokers then the following tuesday blue october uh, same week, Thursday, we have Greg Proops from Whose Line Is It Anyway? And then starting off in, in August, we have Alicia Taylor from The Cherry Bombs. But thank That's you so awesome. much again. We're, it, we're, we're keeping busy somehow. I you mean, guys are like, killing it. Well, so, so are you. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so are you. Well, thank you so much again. And, and until we see you in person, everyone watching, we appreciate you guys watching. Watch and every way. Yes, make sure you guys tune in and we will see you guys real soon. Be safe, everybody. Bye. Thank you.